Okay, so we're going to continue on with our unknowns here. So what's the inflammatory pattern here? So it's mostly lymphocytic. And you see in the dermis, and at least the superficial dermis, maybe a little bit down middle, perivascular, even periadnexal, there's some lymphocytic inflammation. Now, anytime you get lymphocytic inflammation in the dermis, you have to ask yourself, is it truly inflammation or is it neoplastic or is it kind of a mix of the two? So some of these cells look mildly enlarged. There might be more cytoplasm than you're used to seeing for lymphoid cells. There's some overlying spongiosis. So this is um, impossible to get really just on H&E alone. You have to have at least some clinical as well as some process of elimination answer choices to be able to get it correct. But let's say they put lymphomatoid papulosis in the answer choices. So could you say that this is not lymphomatoid papulosis? Remember, lymphomatoid papulosis is clinically a recurring waxing and waning um, ulcerative uh, papular eruption. It can just come and go. It can look a lot like many different presentations clinically and histologically, but the key is the clinical of coming and going. And the main immunohistochemical marker that you're going to want to stain for in most types of lymphomatoid papulosis, CD30, right? So the exception is type B lymphomatoid papulosis, which is CD30 negative usually, and looks a little bit more like mycosis fungoides. But you may notice that in some lymphomatoid papulosis, you've got maybe some enlarged kidney-shaped looking um, cells. You might notice some owl eye looking cells in here. Um, you may notice some that look enlarged like anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, you might find that many of these could be CD8 rich in addition to CD30 positive rich cells. Um, you might find some angio invasion as well. Um, you may find that these are more folliculotropic. So I just kind of went over the different types there. So <clears throat> usually you'll have to remember that lymphomatoid papulosis type A is going to be more of a Hodgkin's lymphoma appearance to it. So uh, Reed Sternberg cells may be seen. Uh, but again, it's not Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's going to be waxing and waning. So clinically, that's where you're going to know it's not um, something you know more serious. Now, there can be clonality to even lymphomatoid papulosis, so it is considered some type of a lymphoproliferative disorder. Again, remember, these cells are going to be CD30 positive usually. So in real life, these things are typically signed out as CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorder. Type B lymphomatoid papulosis is going to look a lot like mycosis fungoides. You might see some epidermotropism. Again, it's coming and going. It's not behaving like a stagnant, established mycosis fungoides. The exception in type B is that these are typically CD30 negative. Type C lymphomatoid papulosis, you're going to look for um, histolo histology, at least, that looks like anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So you've got some large cells in there, maybe some look atypical. Um, however, Type C is usually CD30 positive, but it doesn't stick around like anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So it can be pretty difficult to separate out a CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorder like lymphomatoid papulosis that looks like anaplastic large cell lymphoma, separating that out from a true anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and even separating that out from a mycosis fungoides with CD30 positive large cell transformation. So you have to take into account the clinical. For example, if this is coming and going, it's probably not a true anaplastic large cell lymphoma or a MF with large cell transformation. However, if the patient has a background of MF and they get this CD30 positive, abundant CD30 positive uh, clonal population, then you're going to be able to consider that CD30 positive transformation. And if it's not coming and going, if it's lingering and sticking around for a long time, then you can start to really truly consider anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Plus, if they've got systemic involvement, not just cutaneous involvement, then that obviously becomes more worrisome than just a type C lymphomatoid papulosis. 
type D, you'll often see CD8 positive rich cells. Um, and it can kind of mimic the aggressive epidermotropic uh, CD8 positive um, lympho or, uh, lymphoma. Type E, you're going to be looking for angio invasion. And type F, you'll be looking for folliculotropic collection. So usually those are the types of um, lymphomatoid papulosis that they'll test you on on the board exam. Again, this you would not be able to tell just by looking at this H and E. So you have to have some clinical tip off, and even lymphomatoid papulosis can be much more involved than this. It can be, you know, superficial, mid, and deep, and almost in a sheet-like or nodular growth pattern in a way. But the key is CD thirty positive cells. It can look similar to pityriasis lichenoides at variola formis acuta. However, these cells are usually mononuclear and they're more atypical than what you see in Leva. Of course, you can get erosions and ulcerations of these lesions. You can see superficial and mid perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate, even some deep dermal infiltrate with atypical cells, abundant cytoplasm, large hyperchromatic nuclei. Eosinophils and plasma cells may be present. It doesn't really make much of a difference here. You can see prominent lichenoid infiltrate with perikeratosis, and that's kind of why it can sometimes look like pleva. You can see epidermotropism, which is in that type B phenomenon usually. Extravasated red blood cells, obviously that's more due to the, just the secondary destruction of the vessels, although I don't call this a vasculitis. And most of them are CD30 positive, as I said. However, type B is the exception. Moving on, so do you think this is a neoplasm or inflammatory? So on the left side, you can see that the lymphoid population appears, and I call it lymphoid on the left, I don't know what it is, it appears to be dissecting through the collagen bundles, right? So on the left side, you're not expected to truly know what's going on, just that it may be some interstitial growth pattern and it could be a neoplasm. The middle and the right panels look to be more enlarged epithelioid cells. There appears to be some speckled chromatin in some of them. They're, they're smashing together and kind of molding together. It's a big blue tumor. So your differential would include what? And if you had to choose an immunohistochemical stain to nail the diagnosis, what would you do and what would it show? While you're thinking, I'll just point out this really impressive enlarged atypical mitotic figure. All right, so this is a Merkel cell carcinoma. It's markedly cellular in terms of the infiltrate. It's like a sheet-like growth in most cases, but it can take on different growth patterns. Interstitial growth pattern, trabecular growth pattern. You can see here um, in the middle, it looks to be more like a sheet-like growth pattern. Um, in the left side, it's kind of more of an interstitial or even maybe trabecular type growth pattern. These cells are small, but they are very hyperchromatic. They have very scant cytoplasm. Mostly what sticks out is the nuclei. You can see areas of speckled chromatin collection. And if you did a CK20 on this, it's going to show a perinuclear dot pattern. In most cases, Merkel cell carcinomas are CK20 positive. Now, there are some weird exceptions out there where you don't get classic CK20 expression. There's some aberrant dedifferentiation phenomenon, but for test taking purposes, CK20 is your money stain for Merkel cell carcinoma. You can see some mucin, you can see um, nodular and superficial growth patterns. You can even see some retraction in some areas, um, but it doesn't have the classic peripheral palisading in most cases. That being said, if there's any question, is it a basal cell or a Merkel cell, you're definitely going to have to do a CK20. I like Burr at 4 or EPCAM because it stains basal cells pretty specifically. I mean, at least it stains basal cells in contrast to squames and usually in contrast to Merkel cells as well. <clears throat> so you're going to want to appreciate that sheet like growth pattern. You're going to want to appreciate the granular chromatin pattern, that salt and pepper nucleus, they, they call it, with indistinct nucleoli and nuclear molding. You'll find a lot of mitotic activity. And in fact, Merkel cell carcinomas typically have even close to 100 mitotic figures per square millimeter in some cases. 
much more than a melanoma in comparison, usually. Your differential diagnosis for this is often going to include some type of metastatic lung carcinoma, and that's where you're going to want to do your TTF1 stain. So the TTF1 stain is usually negative in a Merkel cell, and it's usually positive in a metastatic lung carcinoma. Now, often polyoma virus is implicated in these, and usually the polyoma virus negative um, tumors pretend to worse prognosis. Inflammatory or neoplastic? There's some nice collagen trapping phenomenon here, which you get with certain types of neoplasms, which is usually seen in kind of a more interstitial growth pattern phenomenon. It's not always a dermatofibroma. What do you notice about the cells here? How are they structured? They're kind of lining up, right? And they're going interstitially in between the collagen bundles. So your differential for this, anytime you see an interstitial growth pattern of cells that are pretty kind of almost monomorphic and round and epithelioid, not like your typical fibroblastic proliferation, right? metastatic breast carcinoma. This is absolutely fair game for the exam just to get you to have the ability to make this diagnosis on H&E alone without any clinical or stains, as long as you're given other answer choices that don't fit. So if you've got thin cords or linear filing of, you couldn't even maybe even call these malignant cells, but very round kind of clonal cells, among the fibrotic reticular collagen bundles, and you're seeing maybe some areas of halo within and around, which signifies some type of duct formation, then what you can do is entertain the diagnosis of metastatic breast carcinoma. Now, if you had a clinical of a unexplained lesion developing on the chest of a middle-aged female, and then you got this, then you would be even more confident. And, and in that case, they may put things on there that may mimic this, but you're still going to have to be able to pick up on the subtleties of the epithelioid nature of, this, of the cell population, et cetera. So if they gave you that clinical on the chest of a middle-aged female and this high magnification, you shouldn't choose a dermatofibroma. You shouldn't choose granuloma annulari. These are not fibroblasts and histiocytes. These are epithelioid clonal neoplastic cells. So if you did a CK7, you might find that these are positive. If you did a GATA3, you might find that these are positive. Mammoglobin, ER, PR, HER2, again, assuming it's not a triple negative breast cancer. You could do a pan-keratin even just to capture, are these cells of an epithelioid derived nature? So typically, uh, pan-keratin and GATA3 are done as a screen, and you can get some inflammatory processes because, again, these are really small, right? They're, they're small nuclei, not a lot of cytoplasm. So you might just get inflammation within a scar that looks pretty similar to this. You'll definitely want to make sure that these are not... Um, you'll want to confirm that these are rather epithelial cells and not lymphocytes, right? So you can do lymphocyte stains, et cetera, just whatever to make sure beyond a shadow of the doubt that you're dealing with a metastatic breast carcinoma. For the test taking purposes, they will just give you a classic interstitial epithelioid or, you know, carcinoma picture here. And um, via process of elimination, you will be able to choose the right answer, metastatic breast carcinoma. So you may notice a similarity with this case. There's some interstitial growth pattern here as well. However, you know, the cells are small. You can't say on high power, at least on the right-hand side, exactly if these are epithelioid or lymphocyte, right? So your differential probably could still include the metastatic breast cancer here. However, what do they show you in this picture? They show you that there's uninvolvement, uninvolvement of the superficial dermis. So in many times when you've got a neoplastic lymphoid pro population, uh, you'll have uninvolvement of that top layer of the dermis. So this is leukemia cutis. There's a nice grin zone here and you've got a wedge-shaped infiltrate. 
that they say splays down like a congenital nevus in a way, but you'll just kind of notice this dissection of collagen. There's this interstitial pattern here. Diffuse infiltration of the dermis by these mononuclear cells. And in real life, you'll want to go back and see what hematologic malignancy does this patient have? What are the markers associated with this? And stain these cells with those markers to try to figure out, does it correlate or not? So you'd start out with your basic CD20, CD3. You might start out with some plasma cell markers because um, you could have a plasma cytoma that looks similar in, in cases. So CD79A, for example. So you'd want to get a CD20 for B cells, CD3 for T cells, CD79A for plasma cells. Many times leukemia acutis is actually a myeloid differentiation. So you'll want to get myeloperoxidase. You'll want to get um, any, any uh, markers that were detectable in flow cytometry. Sometimes CD34 can be detected. Sometimes CKIT can be detected. It just depends on if you're dealing with more of a lymphoid or a, if you're dealing more with a myeloid population. If you're more along the lymphoid line, you might be getting PDT or PAX-5, um, but really just depends on clinical scenario. But the main pattern here is that you've got this clonal population of neoplastic cells dissecting in between the collagen bundles. Inflammatory or neoplastic. So on the left-hand side, you may have a hard time kind of figuring out, is this a lichenoid inflammation here and you're getting a Max Joseph space? Some of these cells look enlarged with abundant cytoplasm. On the right, you've got what look to be Langerhans cell microabscesses, which you can often see in a contact dermatitis within a spongiotic dermatitis. But what if this was a young child and it looked like seborrheic dermatitis that never got better with ketoconazole. The clinician wants you to rule out a Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So you see nothing here that could allow you to rule it out. In fact, you would have to be very concerned because you've got Langerhans cell microabscesses, which are filled with bean-shaped or kidney-shaped cells. They look to be of the same clonal population. And you would want to do a CD1A and an S100, and these would most likely highlight with that, which would tell you that this is some type of Langerhans cell-rich process. So in this case, these screenshots represent Langerhans cell histiocytosis. In the classic board examples, they will show you um, H&E and expect you to get it from process of elimination. Other answer choices don't fit. So upper dermal lichenoid infiltrate of atypical appearing histiocytes with irregular reniform or kidney-shaped vesiculated nuclei and abundant slightly pink cytoplasm, which you can appreciate in these images. You can see some eosinophils hanging out and some lymphoid cells as well. It doesn't make a difference. Epidermal hyperplasia and spongiosis can be seen. So of course you can see that inflammatory processes as well. So you have to have a clinical that kind of goes along with this. And when, when the clinician is worried about Langerhans cell histiocytosis, I really don't care what it looks like histologically. I'm going to do a CD1A and an S100 to show that they're negative before I say it's not a Langerhans cell histiocytosis, because you may in the planes of section, just have a few um, cells that are staining. And again, you, you're going to get normal Langerhans cell staining in the epidermis, but you're going to want to look for a collection in the dermis too. It, having a lot of Langerhans cells in the dermis is abnormal. And of course, if you've got abundant Langerhans cell histiocytoses and it's everywhere and contact dermatitis doesn't make any sense, then of course you can't rule out Langerhans cell histiocytosis. <laughs> Granulomatous aggregates of histiocytes can be seen with or without giant cells, eosinophils and mixed inflammatory cells. Again, the key stains are S100 and CD1A. Many times I, I will notice that there are histiocytes within inflammation and inflammatory processes. So I'll do a CD1A, S100, and a CD68 just to show that, yes, the cells are normal histiocytes. 
if it's if it's just inflammatory. But if most of the cells are S100 positive and CD1A positive, then that's where you really have to raise the red flag. And just a, a word on this. So on your exams, you know, it's definitely fair game to show you a picture that looks exactly like seborrheic dermatitis and give you a histology picture showing Langerhans cell microabscesses, which typically you're not going to see in your classic seborrheic dermatitis. You're going to see more of a just mix of spongiotic and psoriasiform dermatitis. So with the clinical and with the image alone, you should be able to, to know that that's what they're wanting you to get at. Inflammatory or neoplastic here? Well, it's kind of hard to say, right? You have um, all the way from the dermis down to the, it looks to be sub Q area because you can see some adipocytes here, just this kind of scattered, diffuse lymphoid infiltrate. It's uh, surrounding vessels. It's kind of hard to see, you know, a lot of open vessel lumen here maybe an interstitial pattern, a mixed perivascular and interstitial pattern, in the lymphoid cells. So think of your differential diagnosis here. What would you consider? So many times you're probably gonna have to have a clinical on this. So you, you might find that somebody said that there were these cord-like indurated plaques on the bilateral arms. Um, you may uh, be able to tell that this is kind of deep, so maybe in the level of a fascial plane. And, you know, you, you really don't have to see a lot of eosinophils and eosinophilic fasciitis. It's kind of one of those misunderstandings um, in histology. So eosinophilic fasciitis does not have to have a ton of eosinophils unfortunately, um, what you're really going to want to look for is thickening of the fascia. So this is, there's no epidermis around here, right? So they're pretty deep here. And usually in the biopsies for eosinophilic fasciitis, you're going to want to get like a pretty deep wedge-shaped biopsy. And you're going to want to look for diffuse inflammatory cells consisting of a mixed population. So all comers, you've got lymphocytes, histiocytes, plasma cells, and you can have some eosinophils as well. But it really goes back to the clinical um, so very indurated skin, deep fascial planes, um, usually kind of this cord like structure to the, um, interior arms, usually in the kind of in the flexor, even extending up into the axilla <clears throat> and the clinical, uh, pictures of the, of the groove sign, as they call it, you might be able to see it. On the arms, I would encourage you to look up pictures of the groove sign. Um, but it's the skin has this very characteristic groove running down this uneven plane of the skin. And so you'll see um, this rippled appearance to the skin, very indurated. And then if you had this histology, then you'd be able to say, okay, I can't rule out the asymptomatic fasciitis here. So you do have to have some clinical, you, it's hard to just get the snapshot diagnosis here, but it is important to mention because you could see something like this on a clinical pathologic correlation. So location of the infiltrate matters, the clinical appearance of the groove sign matters as well. So look up pictures of that groove sign. Also, I will say that if you're studying with digital slides, which I highly recommend Path Presenter with the 300 high yield cases, um, they do have a case of eosinophilic fasciitis, and you'll be able to see how deep that inflammation is. So this is a snapshot diagnosis. It's expected to be recognized based on these very kind of slit-like spaces juxtaposed together in different orientations. So kind of these nodules, these small little nodules of slit-like spaces, and then you get to another nodule of slit-like spaces in a different orientation and just kind of looks like plywood, they say. And, and um, you know, anything in dermatopathology can look like anything depending on who says it looks like that. But traditionally, how I've picked up on this is that it just has these fine little spaces split in between the collagen. And if, if you were shown this picture, you should be able to think of a genodermatosis that often corresponds with this. So 
First, you got to know it's a sclerotic fibroma. Then you have to know that it's associated usually with cowdens. It can be by itself without cowdens, but if they want you to know it, it goes along with the genodermatosis. Cowdens disease. And uh, of course, cowdens is associated with other things too, like trichomomas, which we've mentioned in other lectures. And you can go look at the adnexal um, unknown lecture to review what a trichomoma looks like. But sclerotic fibromas are usually also associated with cowdens, and that is due to a P10 mutation. Remember, P10 is a phosphotensin homolog, uh, phosphatase, um, and Instant recognition is going to allow you to get this one point right on your exam. So dome shape architecture, usually hard to know exactly what it is until you do a biopsy. You'll see the sclerotic hyalinized dermis with collagen bundles. And uh, now some people call it a laminated pattern as well. But again, I said slit-like spaces. Some people liken it to plywood um, in terms of the pattern. And you can also see some vascularity here. So areas of open lumen within this as well. The differential diagnosis for something like this, I've seen some late stage erythema elevatum diutinum with not a lot of inflammation that can look very similar as well. So don't be tripped on that. You'd wanna look more for vascular destruction in a late stage erythema elevatum diutinum, as well as maybe some remnants of vasculitis in other parts of the slide to be able to say it's a late stage EED as we call it. All right, so instant recognition here, you can see a lot of granules within the stratum corneum. So retained nuclei, but with a lot of granules. It almost looks like an extension of the granular layer within the perikeratosis. So that's why it's called granular perikeratosis. Now this is in the axilla usually, and so it's called axillary granular perikeratosis. I would review pictures of this clinically and um, think about your differential diagnosis. It can look very similar to other things, and that's why the biopsy is key. So axillary granular perikeratosis, again, it's a snapshot recognition diagnosis. Inflammatory or neoplastic. So depending on uh, what site you're at, you may be kind of thinking, okay, this is forming fascicles. Is it smooth muscle within sites that uh, typically have smooth muscle? So thinking about around the areola or the nipple, uh, around the genital region as well, scrotal areas can have uh, smooth muscle bundles like this. And see this elongation here with the nuclei within the strands. So fascicular architecture and maybe a smooth muscle bundle appearance, ill-defined. So if you were to choose a neoplasm, what would you be thinking? So pyloliomyoma. And these often, so you can have lyomyomas that are derived from the rectal pili muscle. And, and this is typically what this is or you can have lyomyomas that are derived more from the smooth muscle of vessels, and that's usually your angiolyomyoma. So for the pyloliomyoma, you're gonna have a nodular aggregate of poorly circumscribed intersecting smooth muscle bundles. The smooth muscle bundles exhibit mildly eosinophilic cytoplasm. I would highly recommend that you look at a lot of um, smooth muscle neoplasms on the digital slides and compare that to the way that the neural cells look like, because in the uh, smooth muscle on high magnification, you're gonna be able to pick out these vacuolations that are little glycogen storage areas um, for nutrition for the muscle cells. And the nerve cells with their axons typically don't have that. So um, even picking out smooth muscle versus neural on H&E is gonna be important. Now, of course you can do stains for this like smooth muscle actin and Desmond and show it's smooth muscle derived versus doing a SOX 10 or an S100 on neural and be able to tell it's neural derived. But the other things that can help you knowing that this is smooth muscle versus uh, neural is the way it's architecturally spread in an ill-defined manner. It doesn't have this collection of um, 
barricade bodies that you'd expect to see in a schwannoma. And usually with neural cell uh, neoplasms, you'll find areas of maybe for a neurofibroma, you'll find scattered mast cells, which you typically won't appreciate mast cells in a pyeloleiomyoma, et cetera. So uh, that can be helpful too. But even on this lower magnification series, you should be able to appreciate the fasicular growth. Um, some areas of dense nuclei with maybe some vesiculation of the cytoplasm and think about a smooth muscle neoplasm. So some people liken the uh, nuclei to cigar shaped. However, I wouldn't rely just on that. Um, I think that the shapes of the dolphin swimming in neurofibromas can look very similar to the cigar shapes in smooth muscle neoplasm. So I wouldn't look at the nucleus alone. I'd put the whole pattern together and you really have to look at a lot of examples of this to just gain a just stalt of it and uh, optical mileage to be able to say, hey, this is smooth muscle, not neural. You're going to notice a smooth flow to the longitudinally cut bundles. And that's in contrast to the waviness of the cytoplasm and the nuclei that you're going to see in a neurofibroma or even a plexiform neurofibroma. This is a useful analogy that it looks like a cut sponge. And again, that's because you have small little holes. Again, those glycogen vacuolations that you're going to want to look for in the cytoplasm of these cells. Again, um, PATH presenter has those high yield cases. I would highly recommend going through those on high power and comparing the neural neoplasms with the smooth muscle neoplasms. This is a um, first year basic dermatology question, instant recognition diagnosis, just to check yourself here. So if you are a second or a third year, you probably know this within a split second. First year, if you haven't seen it before, you're gonna remember it now. So you have a cup-shaped neoplasm. You've got some homogeneous purple to pink collections of cells. There's kind of some purple areas that then start turning into these pinker uh, inclusion bodies. And this is typically due to a pox virus infection causing molluscum. This is a, an example of an umbilicated papule that you're going to see in molluscum contagiosum. Similar to Veruca, it has buttressing edges on it. Um, similar to a warty disc keratoma at low power, it's got a cup-shaped architecture. And on this power, you may question, are there, is, is there some acantholysis and disc keratosis here? But on high power, it definitely shows you that this is not acantholytic disc keratosis. This is um, viral cytopathic change, but due to uh, pox virus. Doesn't look like herpes virus. It doesn't look like HPV. There's something about this virus that creates these homogenous basophilic and eosinophilic. It's kind of amphophilic in some ways. It takes up both stains in, in some areas, but um, these are called Henderson Patterson bodies. And they're pretty characteristic. Now you can have mermesia, which is caused by HPV on the foot, for example, mermesial wart. It's a lot more involved in this. It's usually larger. It's not a small little cup shape area. And mermesia can look very similar in a lot of ways too. So I would compare molluscum and mermesia, which are caused by different viruses, because I think you have to take into account the low power appearance as well as the high power to be able to get that. 100%, but Mermesia also typically has some areas that are more eosinophilic uh, granular collections within and around these cells too, whereas these are usually just more homogeneous bodies, eosinophilic and kind of basophilic henderson patterson bodies. Um, but they can look pretty similar uh, depending on what you know snapshot you get or what high power area you're looking at. So go ahead and compare digital images of mermesia as well as um, molluscum contagiosum as well. So this is due to pox virus. Let's just review the little paragraph here. So yes, crater form, lobular epidermal hyperplasia, intracytoplasmic purple red oval inclusions known as molluscum bodies or Henderson Patterson bodies develop in the keratinocytes above the basal layer. These molluscum bodies increase in size and become more basophilic as they move upward to the surface. It, 
it kind of depends. I think that they, each individual molluscan body actually looks a little bit more like eosinophilic as you go up, but holistically, um, you may, you may find some areas that look like they're taking up more of the hematoxylin stain. doesn't really matter though. Um, that's not what you're going to use to make the diagnosis. You can see some mild inflammation in the dermis. If the lesion ruptures, you can have acute inflammation. And actually I've had some areas of, I've had some real life cases of super inflamed molluscum that you can barely even find any Henderson Patterson bodies, but then you find like a focal collection of these and you're like, okay, that's uh, just a really ruptured and inflamed molluscum. They would not give that to you on the test, most likely. They would show you some classic picture like this. And if they show you this picture and you don't know it's molluscum, as, as a first year taking the exam, there's really no excuse because this is one of the most recognizable entities in all of dermatopathology. So you have to get this one right. Mm -hmm. A nodule without epidermis can include many different differential diagnoses. We're going to just briefly cover these, and that will be the end of this lecture. All right, so what do you think here? We were just discussing nodules with an overlying epidermis that's not involved. So you're, you're talking about no epidermal involvement here, and you might actually get a slide without any epidermis. So being able to recognize the pattern you might um, appreciate the prominent vasculature to this, maybe some well-circumscribed nature to this neoplasm. And if someone had to have you guess what cell type this would be, you'd probably guess smooth muscle. It might be a little unclear to know 100%, unless you did some stains. However, you can definitely appreciate the well-circumscribed architecture and the vascularity. So you should be entertaining the differential diagnosis, including an angioliomyoma. This is the, uh, some people say it's the only deep tumor that is red. I don't necessarily rely on that, but it can be very acellular. And I've definitely seen examples of this where it looks very eosinophilic and not a lot of cells. This is actually pretty cellular, this example, but you can have prominent acellularity, surprisingly. The thing that helps me make this diagnosis more than anything is the well-circumscribed nature of the nodule with the proliferation of the vessels and the smooth muscle around it. People talk about the blunt and elongated nuclei of the smooth muscles. Yeah, I do agree. It looks similar to a pyelolyomyoma in many ways. And I, I wouldn't get caught up necessarily in the cytology of these cells. I would really just rely on process of elimination. So you're going to be able to say, well, this is not a neurofibroma. This is not a schwannoma. Um, you don't see varicay bodies here. And when you're on high power, you'll see those vacuolations within the smooth muscle, well circumscribed. So this is an angioliomyoma. Now, in reality, I'd want to prove that it's smooth muscle. And so I would just do a Desmond stain and show that it's diffusely positive for Desmond and then sign it out. So from this power, you'll notice this really well circumscribed nodule also doesn't really have a great association with epidermis, but you will notice that there are some keratinocyte looking cells within there. It's got a bluish hue to it on low power and on high power. You see this bluish hue to the neoplasm. It's got some solid areas and some cystic areas, maybe uh, producing some pinkish material that's got some uh, blade kind of artifact edges within it, often sweat material or acrine material looks to be like this on H&E. So a chondroid hue to it with solid and cystic areas. This is one that people forget to think about, but it's a chondroid syringoma or also known as a mixed tumor. You see these well and tubular lumina. You see these well, um, tubular lumina lined by two or three layers of stratified circumscribed um, uh, neoplastic formations. And it can be situated even as deep into the subcutaneous tissue. You'll notice some solid areas, but you'll notice some cystic cavities as well, covered by cuboidal cells. So it kind of makes you think about 
a duct-like neoplasm. There's mucoid or mixoid stroma, and that's where you get that chondroid appearance because of that blue hue. Again, this is not cartilage, but it's chondroid. It looks like cartilage. You can appreciate some basaloid cells that are forming nut-like patterns with numerous luminal spaces and are closely associated with surrounding fibrous stroma. And again, they can appear cartilaginous. So this is why you get your chondroid syringoma. Don't forget to think about this entity. If, if it's in the answer choices, go back and make sure that, you know, if you see chondroid syringoma in your answer choices and you see something that has a chondroid hue to it with solid and cystic areas, it's going to be real hard for you not to choose that as an answer, especially if you got some eccrine secretion here too. Um, now the differential diagnosis for something, if you see papillations like this, you might be thinking about a hydradenoma papilliform because it's well circumscribed. Typically, I don't see the hydradenoma papilliforms as deeply situated as the chondroid syringoma. I like to see, you know, even the hydradenoma papilliforms have plasma cells within it, <clears throat> not as much as a syringocyst adenoma papilliform, but you can still see some plasma cells. So that might be under differential as well. However, um, usually with hydradenoma papilliform, you don't have a chondroid appearance to the stroma. So this is probably a little tough for be beginners because it, it looks non-specific. You've got dense, hard to say, it's an inflammation over on the left side. In the middle, you've got this sheet light kind of growth pattern with some areas of uh, fasciculation, maybe some areas that are thinner and more acellular and then they pick up in the cellularity. So you might even think there's some palisading going on here. So on higher power, that's where, really where you're going to get to the diagnosis. So low power, you'll be able to say, okay, it's nodular and it's a proliferation. On higher power, you're going to be able to see that there's these fibroblastic looking type cells that almost have these areas of single cell growth that are spreading out, almost like if they were growing on a plastic dish. And so that is your tissue culture-like growth pattern that you're going to want to see in a nodular fasciitis. So there's more pictures here that um, just show the variations on theme of proliferation. Um, it's going to be one that you're going to get by clinical scenario of a nodular proliferation deeper situated into the tissue with some high power images showing some tissue-like growth pattern. As I just said, it's associated with deep uh, placement in the tissue and the skin tissue. You can often have um, nodular fasciitis developing deeper even into soft tissue, and it's not going to be a, on derm path necessarily, but when it's situated more superficially, that's where you're going to have to know about your nodular fasciitis. So this is associated with the fascia in many cases, as well as the deep fibrous septa. It's poorly, um, it can be poorly or well circumscribed depending on um, the nature of the neoplasm. And you'll find these cellular spindle cells uh, with, with high vascularization around it. And in many cases, even a myxomatous stroma. You can find large fibroblasts, which exhibit some pleomorphism and some multinucleation with numerous normal appearing mitotic figures. So this is, you know, definitely challenging in real life because you have to think about other low grade uh, mixofibrosarcomas or even fibromyxosarcomas. You have to um, have a high degree of suspicion of anything malignant happening when you see a lot of mitotic figures as well. So clinically, the classic uh, nodular fasciitis on a young person on the arm, deep situated with just bland fibroblastic appearing cells, such as the one on the right panel here, that's where you're really going to have to go with the uh, nodular fasciitis. But it can be pretty difficult. Um, in older patients, you're going to want to make sure you're not missing a fibromyxosarcoma or a myxofibrosarcoma. So if, if you don't see areas of um, atypical mitotic figures, you don't see dense necrosis, then it's probably not going to be something more serious. You can send it for, for molecular sequencing um, to really look and see if there are any translocations or mutations that are associated with more serious sarcomas. But for the purposes of this talk, it's just to remind you of this entity. 
um, and know what to look for on H&E to consider it as a possibility. Now, if they were expecting you to choose nodular fasciitis on an exam, it would only be because you can rule out other things in the differential diagnosis. So for example, if they asked you to say, was, is this a DFSP? Well, you don't see classic story form um, architecture uh, to this. So you, and, and if they told you that it's CD34 negative, then you probably wouldn't think that it's nodular or that it's a DFSP. However, it's just SMA positive and it's just a fibroblastic or myofibroblastic um, <clears throat> proliferation, then you can think about a nodular fasciitis. So again, um, you can see some lymphocytic inflammation in this as well. The lesions can have abundant mucin, rich vascularity. There can be some cytoplasmic vacuoles that make you think of a liposarcoma. So you'll want to do definitely an MDM1 to uh, look and make sure there's no overexpression of MDM1 if you see some lipoblast-like cells. Um, if you did mucin stains in these, typically though, you would find that those little vacuoles are more positive for colloidal iron and alcium blue, suggesting it's mucin instead of lipid droplets. They can infiltrate the fat. Nodular fasciitis can infiltrate the fat and it can even show some plump epithelioid fibroblasts. Fibroblasts could be compact and produce a lot of mucin as well as collagen within the extracellular space. And this is that key word of residing in a loose mucoid matrix as tissue culture-like cells. So you see here, this is, this is going to be your classic. The, the right-handed side picture here is going to be your classic for nodular fasciitis. Now, this giant cell rich um, picture here is just to show you can have some giant cells within the mix um, that can be complicating interpretation for sure. So uh, that's not going to be your classic test example. I'm just letting you know in real life, you can have some nodular fasciitis with some giant cells um, proliferating within it. Remember, mitotic figures can be present in this, but it's they're usually normal mitotic figures. So you'll either see a normal prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. You're not going to see tripolar mitotic figures or multipolar mitotic figures, et cetera. So kind of sticking with the theme of giant cells from the last example. So if you see a lot of giant cells and you think you may be deep situated around a tendon, then you're going to have to entertain the diagnosis of giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. On these two images, you can see the well-circumscribed lobular nature of the neoplasm. And you can see that it kind of takes on a spindle-like architecture. There's a mixture of spindled and epithelioid cells within a fibrous or hyalinized stroma. But interspersed among those cells are multinucleated giant cells and they resemble osteoclast-like giant cells. They've got some darkly eosinophilic cytoplasm. Many of them do. Um, they look kind of purple here. They kind of stick out to you um, in contrast to normal H&E staining. And continuity with the tendon sheath is, that would be preferred to be seen in your example. Um, however, it, depending on the power that you're looking at, you may not be able to see that depending on the orientation of the slide. So clinically, um, it's going to be deep enough that the clinician is going to be thinking it's connected to some type of tendon. And if you get this giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, now you can have giant cell tumor of soft tissue, which is not associated with the tendon sheath, but looks pretty much like this. Unfortunately, in a giant cell tumor with tendon sheath, you may have some areas with no giant cells and only show epithelial cells with inflammation some xanthomatized histiocytes were a mixture of those patterns. And also unfortunately complicating things is that a malignant fibrous histiocytoma or pleomorphic dermal sarcoma may have similar cells, but it always has malignant cells as well. So if you're searching through this thing and you're just finding these bland spindled and epithelioid cells with these impressive giant cells, then you'll have to say, well, I can't rule out giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath, and that's probably going to be your answer. 
on an exam, if they're showing you giant cells, it's probably going to be an entity that classically has giant cells. So don't, don't get confused by the variations of things that may have giant cells, but not classically have giant cells for test taking purposes. All right, so this is kind of a snapshot diagnosis. You'll notice the palisading of cells and there's some areas where you can literally draw a line and almost like trace out areas where there are no cells. And so that is known as a varicae body because it's an acellular eosinophilic area that you can just kind of go through and not touch a single cell pretty easily, right? So if you can trace out areas like that, where it's easy to trace your, your pointer and you're not touching cells, you need to think about palisading cells forming varicae bodies. And that should be the buzzword for you to know that this is a schwannoma. You will see this varicae body type palisade and type A, Antony type A areas. In contrast to away from that, maybe on the exterior parts of Antony A where you don't, you just have a loose mixoid area, that's Antony type B. You will be expected to just diagnose a schwannoma only if you see Antony type A areas. So that's your schwannoma, Antony type A. <clears throat> You'll find encapsulated intradermal nodules with multiple foci of low cellularity, as well as moderate cellularity. We talk about biphasic patterns with that type A and type B. So zones of spindle cells and parallel palisaded arrangement, that's your barricade body in type A. And then in contrast, less cellular loose mixoid areas in type B. You will be expected to get schwannoma correct if you see only type A. If you only see type B, it's gonna be difficult to call that a schwannoma. So know that for test taking purposes, they're gonna have to show you at least some type A tissue. You can see some hyalinized vessel walls. So you can have some pretty vascular schwannomas. If you stain this for SOX10 or S100 neural markers, it, they'll be diffusely positive. You can get plexiform schwannomas, which are similar to plexiform neurofibromas in that low power, you've got these enlarged separated fascicles. Flexform um, schwannomas can often be associated with um, neurofibromatosis type 2. So remember, schwannomas, um, you can think about being present in neurofibromatosis type 2. So this is a very pleomorphic neoplasm, and you've got some really just kind of undifferentiated, ill-defined cells. You can't really say what the nature of this is. So let's say this was growing on the scalp of an elderly patient, and this was the deep histology. You don't see any epidermis overlying it. So let's say this was on excision, and you found a lot of these pleomorphic cells just proliferating throughout almost like a sheet-like growth pattern because you don't find well-defined nodules, um, some scattered cells with multiple nuclei in them, some scattered mitotic figures, maybe on a digital slide, you can appreciate that more. So what types of neoplasms would you want to rule out here? You'd want to do um, keratin stains to make sure you're not dealing with some poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, including a P63, because remember, some squamous cell carcinomas can be so poorly differentiated that it doesn't express keratins anymore. So you'll want to do a P63 and make sure that's negative or a P40, because usually the P63 or P40 will be positive still in a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So let's say that's negative. You'll want to do your melanocyte marker stains. So you'll want to do SOX10 and melan A and make sure those are negative. What else? Maybe a Desmond stain to make sure this isn't types of some type of a rhabdoid sarcoma or malignant um, muscle-derived lyomyosarcoma. You could also consider doing a myogenin or a myOD. 
make sure it's not a rhabdo related myosarcoma. Maybe you're thinking an epithelioid sarcoma, so you'd want to do an INI1 and make sure that there was nuclear retention here, because if INI1 was lost, then that would be highly suggestive of an epithelioid sarcoma and up to 90% of epithelioid sarcomas. So saying that all of the markers we just discussed are negative and INI1 is retained, what else can you think about? I said on the scalp, you might notice that there are some vessels here, some very pleomorphic cells. So maybe do an ERG, an ERG, um, to make sure that this is not endothelial cells that have become malignant. So you definitely don't want to miss an angiosarcoma that's looking wall-to-wall -wall epithelioid and pleomorphic. So let's say that's all negative. So then you're kind of left thinking about <clears throat> an entity called an AFX or even a deeper pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. Let's say you found perineural invasion and you found some necrosis in here. So that's gonna be more fitting with a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. Separating out an atypical epithelial to spindle cell proliferation on the scalp of an elderly person and calling it AFX or PDS, depending on the extent of involvement is appropriate. But if you've got an excision that's showing deeper involvement, perineural invasion, areas of necrosis, you have to be thinking about a pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. Now that traditionally people refer to these as malignant fibrous histiocytomas as well. So so you can think of it as a dermatofibroma gone bad in a way. However, the true um, differentiation of these cells it's a little bit unclear, probably related to fibrohistiocytic cells. And again, I, I wouldn't say that every AFX or PDS is similar in terms of its um, genetics. Everybody has a different background genetics and there could be different driver mutations. And there are some recent new papers that discuss maybe some contributing uh, genetic alterations. And there are some ongoing studies to look and see if um, there are markers that can predict whether this is a PDS or an AFX, even on superficial biopsy. So those studies are ongoing. But these are usually process of elimination. You have to make sure you rule out other things with immunohistochemistry before you call it. So in this case, we're dealing with a malignant fibrous histocytoma or some type of pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. Like atypical fibrosanthoma, they have high areas of cellularity, spindle fibroblast-like cells and histiocytes. You can see some foamy cells, some giant cells. Again, you're not going to necessarily rely on any of these one things in, in particular. It's going to be more of the clinical behavior, the growth pattern, and the process of elimination with immunohistochemistry. You'll see some areas of high cellularity with spindle cells, pleomorphic hyperchromatic nuclei, numerous mitotic figures. You can see some areas of story form pattern. So doing a CD34 and demonstrating that that's negative too, that you're not dealing with some type of DFSP um, <clears throat> if you have that case. With histocytic cells, you can see those um, cells contain variable amounts of cytoplasm as well as pleomorphic hyperchromatic nuclei, some scattered so-called bizarre monster nuclei, and even atypical mitotic figures. They can be uh, predominantly mixoid. And in that case, you're going to be having to think about a mixofibrosarcoma. And you can find some areas with hypocellularity as well. So mixofibrosarcomas are different than, um, than pleomorphic dermal sarcoma or AFX. So if you can, if you can find a mixofibrosarcoma, um, then you're going to want to appreciate that really predominant mixoid background. And again, I would recommend doing um, sequencing and maybe a soft tissue uh, sequencing panel through molecular labs. So that way you can identify any particular mutations in these entities. And usually um, with in mixofibrosarcomas, you can find um, just kind of nonspecific immunohistochemical profile. And so we talked about everything we would do to rule out the other entities, but you can still see some bimentin, which is kind of a useless stain because it stains almost everything. Maybe some focal 
uh, SMA, maybe some focal CD34, but not diffusely positive. And if you were looking into like molecular um, analysis, you might find some mutations in driver pathways. So NTRK1 has been found before. Um, you can have some other lesser known um, VGL L3 amplification. You can have some amplifications in so-called TRIO, T-R-I-O, or Richter, which is spelled R-I-C-T-O-R, but ultimately affects the AKT and M mTOR pathways. Um, so you're not going to just sign this out. Um, if you find a very diffuse mixoid background and you're considering a mixofibrous sarcoma, you're definitely going to want to team up with soft tissue experts as well as um, maybe doing some molecular analysis just to make sure that you're not dealing with a mixofibrosarcoma. So again, uh, your differential diagnosis can be pretty broad here. Um, if you're considering a mixofibrosarcoma, then you're probably also going to be thinking about a fibromyxoid sarcoma. So just basically switching those words around. Um, but you'll have to probably do a MUC4 in those instances because in MUC4 positivity, you'll you'll usually find MUC4, MUC4 expression is more usually positive in low-grade fibromyx, fibromyxoid sarcomas. And if you do some analysis and look for some fusions in a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, you'll often find a fusion between the FUS and the CRED 3L2 genes. So just some things to think about. Um, soft tissue is a challenging area of dermatopathology. And so uh, we will reserve deeper discussions in other lectures dedicated to soft tissue tumors. I do recommend um, reading Dr. Steve Billings' book on soft tissue tumors of the skin, as well as um, reading obviously the relevant chapters in McKee, Whedon, as well as Jared Gardner videos um, to have a nice review of soft tissue tumor. Just a friendly reminder that anytime you see uh, proliferation and you see some scallop nuclei, some multivesicular changes in the nuclei or around the nuclei and in the cytoplasm, you, you appreciate some bubbliness to the cells that you'll want to consider sebaceous um, differentiation and doing a dipophilin on this. There are papers, and it's a little bit controversial, that even a frame stain can highlight the more lipophilic sebaceous parts of a sebaceous carcinoma because PRAME normally stains normal sebaceous glands. Depending on the clone, if you're looking at the PRAME clone EPR2330, you might have better luck with staining more sebaceous areas of a tumor. Um, and some recent reports show that the PRAME stain uh, with the EPR2330 was on par with the dipophilin in terms of marking sebaceous differentiation. However, if it's a poorly differentiated sebaceous carcinoma, you may not find a lot of um, classic sebaceous vacuole areas that would stain positive too. So these can be pretty challenging. Your differential diagnosis on an image like this may include some clear cell entities as well, like balloon cell melanoma, or maybe some renal cell carcinoma, maybe some distinct dermal um, clear cell tumors, things like that of that nature. So it can be pretty tough. You can even have basal cell carcinomas with clear cell change or basal cell carcinoma with uh, sebaceous differentiation. All right, we are going to stop here and uh, we'll start on this next slide for the, the next lecture.